Vital, Joel here in Squamish, British Columbia. And for the last three months or so, I've been comparing Transition's 120 mil spur to Yeti's SB115. No surprise, 115 mils of travel. For the last few months, like I said, back to back each day with these two bikes, I've got hundreds of miles on both bikes now, and I've got a really strong sense of who these bikes might be better suited for, where each of these bikes shines, and also which one of these two bikes is my personal preference. So the transition spur, like I said, 120 mils of travel front and rear. We've got SID suspension from RockShox front and rear. So that's the SID Lux rear shock at 120 mils of travel. SRAM drivetrain front to back, uh, DT Swiss wheels, uh, Maxxis dissector up front, and a Maxxis Recon, now E13 LG1R semi-slick in the rear. Uh, pretty dialed part spec right from the get-go. This is a bike that you can pull out of the box, build it up, and go shred. The Yeti SB115 has a Fox Float 34 fork and a Fox Float DPS shock. That's 130 mils of travel up front and 115 mil out back. SRAM takes care of drivetrain duties on the SB115 and they also take care of the braking duties. You've got G2 brakes for the Yeti with good size rotors and you've got a Fox transfer dropper post. The two builds are actually quite similar. Uh, wheel sets are almost identical. You've got drivetrains almost identical and you do have different suspension brands but definitely kind of the comparable product from RockShox and Fox respectively. So all out, you've got these two really, really similar builds. And so for me, what was nice is that I was able to really compare the pros and cons of the bikes rather than their builds. So the Yeti SB115 goes about geometry very differently than does the transition. So to begin with, you've got the front and rear triangles from the SB100 XC race bike. From there, what Yeti has done is manufactured a different link and they're using a different shock with obviously different stroke numbers to produce a little bit more travel, a little bit different use of the travel as well compared to the SB100, but they were able to create the bike that many of Yeti's employees were already riding with the SB100. They found that they were already putting a long fork on it and meatier tires and burlier wheels. And so what they did is they just created the link and you know did some shock work to get the bike that they really wanted for shredding around the office. Transition on the other hand, they've gone about their geometry from the ground up. This is a completely new bike from them. It's their first, if you want to call it, cross country bike. Uh, and what they've done is you can tell that their influence has really been more coming from the sort of longer travel bikes. So this size large has 480 mils of reach. And for me, that was really, really comfortable and intuitive right off the bat, because that's what I've been used to as a guy who's usually riding longer travel bikes and earlier bikes, the Spur on the other hand was a perfect fit for me. Now the Yeti SB115, as I've mentioned, with more traditional numbers, it took some time for me to adjust to because I felt like the bike was a little bit more compact than I like. So much so that even at under six feet tall, I'm riding the extra large Yeti SB115 compared to the large transition spur. And for me, what I was trying to do is just get numbers more similar to what I am used to because the large Yeti for my riding style where I live here in Squamish is too compact for me to descend comfortably whereas the transition spur is a little bit longer, a little bit more familiar, and I can ride rougher, faster trails, and that added wheelbase really holds a better line for me and is more comfortable for me. So on the climbing side, the Yeti SB115 and the Switch Infinity uh, rear suspension system is outstanding. This is probably one of the best climbing bikes I've ridden in my entire life. Um, not just in terms of working its way up roads, but also on technical climbs. Yeti's done a really, really good job of balancing a supportive rear suspension 
with something that can still work its way through the travel when you are climbing technical trails like we have so many of here in Squamish. Never had to use the climb switch. Uh, outstanding climbing bike. The Transition Spur, on the other hand, uh, it's not that it's not also an excellent climber, it just really had some tough competition in this instance. What I preferred about the Transition is the steeper seat tube angle that really makes a difference I found on the Yeti that even with the saddle slammed as far forward as I could get it in its rails, I still wished for a steeper seat tube angle. And on shorter rides, this wasn't really a big impact for me, but on longer rides, I really found that that steeper seat tube angle puts me in a much more comfortable position and a stronger position as well. So transition gets my nod for better climbing geometry. Descending on these two bikes really comes down to what style of rider you are. If you tend to descend short, punchy, little, kind of 30 second descents where you're in and out of the saddle relatively often, the SB115 might be a better suited bike for your riding. For myself, if I lived on the east coast of Canada where we don't have the vertical, but we still have punchy technical trails where you have to pedal through chop and then descend through something short and abrupt and back up something short and abrupt on the other side, the SB115 is a great bike for that application. The Transition Spur is a better bike for a place like the Pacific Northwest, and it's no surprise that this bike came out the way it did with Transition's offices only being a couple hours from here in Squamish. The geometry kind of also really allows it to punch above its, sort of its, what its travel numbers might suggest. Now this bike is better suited to the rider who's probably coming at things with more of a gravity bias to their riding. And even if you live in a flat area, if you consider yourself to be a gravity rider where you sort of climb to the top, as soon as you're at the beginning of a rolling descent, the seat goes down, you stand up and you begin looking for ways to generate speed and ways to really uh, increase speeds on trails and hold speeds through rough sections, the Transition Spur is a better fit for you. To call one of these two bikes better than the other is a really tough task. My opinion is that these two bikes are better suited for different terrain and different style of riders. As I've said, the Yeti SB115 is better suited for a rider used to traditional geometry and a rider who lives in an area where there's more transitions between seated and standing, speeds are generally lower, and you would consider yourself more of an XC background rider. The Transition Spur, on the other hand, is better suited for burlier terrain where speeds are higher and for a rider who considers themselves to be more of a gravity biased rider. And again, that doesn't mean you're only riding descents. It just means that you are used to dropping the saddle, making use of wheelbase, making use of longer reach slacker head tube angles to hold speed rather than tiptoeing through things. You're more likely to manual or gap your way through things compared to the Yeti. So which one of these two bikes would I take home? Which bike is my preferred bike? Which bike did I reach for more often over the last few months? For me, that was the Transition Spur. And for me, again, I think that's just a reflection of where I live, what I ride, and sort of my general riding style. I would say that this bike, as mentioned, is a downhillers cross-country bike. I would have no problem racing cross-country on this bike. I'd be more than happy to take this thing into the BC bike race, local XC beer league races, or even more, you know, sort of if you're a higher performance XC racer, you can still make this thing a pure World Cup XC race bike. The difference being is that you can take this also to technical terrain like Squamish and not feel like you're gonna break the thing. And so for that reason, this is my preferred bike. In a perfect world, what I would do is I would take this bike's geometry and I would apply this bike's suspension. And I think that that would obviously be the differentiation between the two. We've got better geometry here, and I would say we've got more refined suspension over here. And so if I could make the perfect short travel XC sort of hybrid trail bike XC bike, for me, if I could have that, 
it would honestly probably replace bikes in the 130 to 150 mil travel range. I would get rid of those bikes in favor of a shorter travel bike that has geometry like an enduro bike and suspension that is way more forgiving than 115 mils ever should be.